Nothing by a hurry. Come on, hush it, for hurry more. How come on, stop a little. How come on? How come on? Falschewohler. That means great welcome. And welcome to the secret of wearing a kilt. My name is Ron Cameron. And my name is Mark Cantwell. So, we are hosts for this program, and we're going to show you how to take the difficulty and the mystery out of wearing a great kilt. Ron, what is the secret to wearing a great kilt? Well, Mark, the secret of the kilt, the great kilt, is in its versatility. It can be worn as a cloak or as a great play, as Jeff is now wearing. It can be used as a sleeping bag or fashioned into reindeer. A single kilt can be worn in many different arrangements, depending on the mood of a man. You make it sound like only men wore kilts. Women wore kilts also. That's right, Jennifer. Only the woman's kilt is normally referred to as another side, and it's worn over the woman's dress. In this video, we will demonstrate how to fold and place a great plate, or as it is known at this time, the break and field. An attestate. And a wee kilt, also known as a filler bag. We'll also talk to you about some of the things to wear with and under your kilt. For your break and field, you will need a length of fabric 54 to 60 inches wide and 5 to 9 yards long for using 5 yards. And a waist belt 10 inches longer than your waist size. You'll also need a thong or a brooch. Great. We're going to go over a few of the terms in the pattern of the tartan itself. The first term you need to know is the set. This is the large colored pattern that makes up the great majority of the fabric. The set is two repetitious patterns of stripes, one horizontal and one vertical. The set on this particular one would begin at the green stripe here and end again with the green stripe here. The beginning and end are determined by the second element, which is called a pivot. And that's this difference in colored line here at either end. Each set is mirrored from right to left from each pivot. In other words, it's a copy. So we have two green, two gray, and two more blue. And that repeats itself again in reverse. For doing our pleating, we're going to be using the pivots as our measuring point and as reference. The first thing I'm going to show you is going to be pleating to stripe. And this is what's used today in, mostly in military kilts because it's the easiest one to do and it uh, changes the pattern of the fabric at the back of the kilt. To do pleating to stripe, what we're going to do is, this will be our lead pattern here, this double line of braid, and we'll come over here and pick out our second over set and go from this pivot and pull it directly across like so, and we match up the space between them as the same distance between the two together. So we now have three equal distant dark stripes between the sets, or the pivots, I'm sorry. We're going to continue our pleating in this fashion. And you'll notice this eats up a lot of fabric right away. And this is because the, uh, the military kilts and the old style kilts had a much larger amount of fabric in them than the, the uh, kilts of uh, the 18th and 19th century. So these pleats are going to be much deeper. And you'll see how we repeat this pattern right along the line. And you can see how it's beginning to destroy the horizontal pattern and turn it into an entirely vertical one. I'm going to pull a few more over here so you can get the idea of the effect once it's finished. And we'll just do one more here. Now, you can see from this then how pleating to stripe changes the, the front apron pattern 
and the pleating pattern into two different uh, designs entirely. And what happens is then when you're walking uh, for a military parade, the pleats open up, show the full pattern, and then close back up again. And this gives uh, an animated action to the back of the kilt. The second pattern we're going to do is pleating to set. And this is mostly used in civilian kilts these days. And the kilt, the uh, pleating is done so as to repeat the pattern rather than destroying it the same the way that the pleating to stripe does. So to do this, we're going to take every other pivot again and we're going to line it up exactly with the next pivot rather than next to and we're going to alternate which pivots we work from so that we're going to match up firstly our red one just so and next we're going to go by our yellow pivot and it's going to be matched up exactly. Now this style is a little bit harder to keep in and it's associated with the modern kilts that have the pleats sewn in permanently because then they're always locked in place and you don't have to worry about folding them or having them fall out later on. Next one, we'll go back to the red pivot, and we'll bring that across, and we'll do another yellow one, just so you can get the effect. compare our pleat to set with the open pattern of the unpleated fabric and you'll see that it is exactly the same and we haven't broken up the pattern of the fabric at all. First, lay your fabric out flat. If you don't have enough room, drop fold one end like this. This will be the excess from which you take all of your pleats. Next, we will determine the size of the aprons. The aprons will be one span width. A span is the length from the point of your elbow to the end of your middle finger. Mark the point where it's measured. And we'll begin pleating. With either method that we've shown here, Begin pleating, pull your first pleat to the span mark that we've already determined. Continue pleating, making sure to lay the fabric out flat and to smooth out any wrinkles. Only the lower portion of the kilt needs to be pleated, as you can see here as the upper part will fall out straight when the belt is fastened. Continue pleating your fabric until you have one span width left at the other end as well. Now, lie down on the center of the pleats making sure that the bottom edge of the kilt just touches the back of your knees. Take up the right apron and draw it across to your left hip. Tuck in the excess fabric and make sure that the apron lies straight and flat. After tucking in your excess, Take up the left apron, bring it across, and lay it against your right hip. 
Now, fasten your belt in place, and you can stand up and shake out the cleats so that they hang straight. At this point, we're going to make sure that the outside apron hangs a bit lower than the inside one for a neater appearance. A quick pull on the fabric will straighten that out. To arrange the upper portion, take up the left corner of the kilt, as you see here, and pleat it two to four times, as demonstrated. This portion is drawn around to the back, shaken out so that it hangs straight, and tucked in at the base of the spine. Take up the back left corner now, and draw it up over the left shoulder. Again, shake out the pleats so that everything hangs straight. Now hold the fabric in your teeth, and take up the right corner of the kilt. As you see here. Again, pleat it two to four times. Draw it up. At this point, they may be fastened with a leather thong, or in this case, as you can see, with this bunny penannular brooch. The brooch does not need to be passed through the fabric, as you can see here, Friction is enough to hold it into place. All right then, laddie. Why don't you give us a look? <laughs> That's grand. In the next method, both corners are taken up, each are pleated two to four times, as in the last method, and they are both tucked in at the center of the spine in the back, as you can see here. The entire rear section of the kilt is now shaped as a large triangle. The center point is drawn up over the left shoulder, as in the last method. The cleats are shaken out again to make sure that they hang straight. And the brooch is taken up and is pinned through the point directly into the garment. This is a 17th and 18th century style and is still used today as well. It's best used with a jacket as the weight of a shirt cannot hold up the kilt. For inclement weather, the entire portion of the kilt at the back may be drawn up over the head and wrapped around the upper body. As you can see, this gives excellent protection from the elements. For manual labor, both corners are tucked in and then the bottom corner is tucked in as well. This gives free movement to the entire upper body for manual labor around the farm. Philabeg, the wee kilt. The first step for the philabeg is to fold your fabric in half, as you can see here. The belt is placed at your waist height, and the one span width of the apron is measured out. By whatever method you choose, take up your pleats and lay them out. As in the other methods, be sure to flatten them out so as to give a pleasing effect when the kilt is worn. Continue pleating your fabric until you have used up the remainder of the cloth. This is the same method as in all the other types. As you can see, the entire length of the fabric is being pleated here, from top to bottom. And this is why. The excess top portion is folded down so as to adjust the length to fit your body. Straighten out the pleats where they are folded over. Make sure it is lying flat. and lie down in the center of the pleats, as before. 
Take up your right apron and draw it across to your left hip again. Make sure that it lies flat and straight. Tuck in the excess folds and draw across your left apron. Lay that down across your right hip. Straighten it out and fasten your belt. This method of wearing the kilt dates easily from the year 1700 through to the modern times. And some uh, scholars say that it actually goes back to about the year 1600. Now the addition of a targe, and you're ready for the war trail. Arasaid, the woman's kilt. To arrange the arasaid, the fabric is pleated and belted on in the same fashion as the Brecon feel, as you can see. However, as this is an outer garment, the aprons are narrower and do not cross over in the front. The corners are now taken up, passed over the shoulders, and fastened together over the chest with a brooch, as you can see. The pieces may also be tied together with a thong. Now, as you can see, the back hangs down like a large cloak. For inclement weather, this portion may be drawn up over the head and you're ready for a grand soft evening, lassie. Ah, and modest she is too. Well, Ron, we've got our Brecken fields folded, we've got them belted, and we've got them arranged at our shoulders. But other things you suppose uh, a lot of us could wear with them in the way of, say, shirts. Well, any shirt is appropriate for the period of time you're in. Tell us about your particular period of time, Mark. All right, then. Uh, this is a mid-17th century Scottish outfit. Uh, the shirt itself would be common throughout most of the British Isles and a lot of Europe as well. The, the cuffs are made with a box pleated ruff, as is the collar. The uh, sleeveless doublet that I'm wearing, as well, is very much of that period. It has the sloping tabs on the front of it, a very small set of buttons uh, set close together, and it also has the shoulder wings, which are very fashionable at that time. A uh, coat like this could also have sleeves as well, which might have the seams left open to allow part of the shirt to fluff through. I'm also wearing a rather uh, plain uh, plaid, as you might see in uh, the lower classes or in a professional soldier. We also have someone here from an earlier time period. This is Scottish dress of the period of the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, this is the time period of William Wallace and Robert Bruce. Uh, Jeff here has on an Irish style Lena shirt. You see it has very wide sleeves. This is very common in Irish dress at that time. And the Scots are very closely associated with the Irish at this time. And so you see them using a lot of the same dress. He's also wearing a very plain type of tartan here, a very earth colored as you might find very common uh, homemade dyes. And his plaid is actually tied with a leather thong rather than with a brooch. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And what have you got on there? Hi, what I'm wearing is an 18th century costume. You might have seen it in the movie Rob Roy or any movie of the period of the, since the Restoration all through the Jacobite period. What I have here is a coat usually made of tartan, sometimes made of a solid fabric, even sometimes bound in leather. I'm wearing an 18th century shirt with a javet and lace cuffs, which were very common and also worn quite often throughout the 18th century. The buttons on the coatee are spaced a little further apart than the waistcoat. The waistcoat buttons are buttoned all the way down, small buttons, quite a number of them. The pocket flaps, Buttons are just below the actual part of the pocket here, the, the flap of the pocket. And the same goes for the, the coat, the coatee. This is a sprue, as opposed to the modern day sporum. The sprue was around throughout 15th century Scotland, all the way through 18th century Scotland. Highland regiments were wearing them still 
all the way up to the American Revolution. This is a dirk. Dirk probably was the most widely used weapon of the Highland man. It was designed to punch through chain mail, and it's also a remnant of the phallic dagger. And also the Irish have a knife similar to it, and it's also a uh, copy of that particular knife. I'm also wearing a baldric to carry my basket hilt. The Scots were very flamboyant. Their costume was very flamboyant and artistic, and perhaps that's why it made them such good soldiers that they had pride in their costume and their outfit and their accoutrements. And of course, you can go without any sort of a shirt at all. Aye, that's true. In fact, you can go bare-legged. Healer men were often referred to by the English as red shanks for the fact that they were wearing no bows at all and that their legs were cold. Also, there are many types of hose worn in the throughout the history of Scotland, and Mark's going to elaborate on his now. All right, what I'm wearing on my legs is a pair of Akra or Moggins. It's a type of legging that goes from the ankle to just below the knee, and they're held on with a pair of garters. Over those, I'm wearing a pair of wool socks, which are down over my feet and into the shoes that I'm wearing themselves. Later in history, you might find healing men wearing hose. Hose are either cut from cloth, as these are, or they were knit. These were more prevalent, though, through the 18th century, as it, they were easier to make. You cut the cloth on the bias, and you sew them to fit. The shoes I'm wearing are buckle shoes of the 18th century and 17th century. They were prevalent in that period of time. The shoes that I'm wearing are the type that were prevalent uh, throughout most of Europe during the late Renaissance and most of the 17th century as well. They have a very high decorative tongue and cutouts on the sides, which allow the rich fabrics of the hose and stockings to show through. And as you can see, they're also buckled, which would be a style that continued throughout the 18th century. Another type of footwear that uh, was popular with Gaelic peoples from ancient times up until even the 18th century was a shoe called the Curran. And uh, it's made of soft leather, uh, entirely of one piece, as you can see. Uh, it slips over the foot, and the laces are long enough that once it's tied up, they will continue around the leg up to the knee so as to hold the hose or, uh, or shin guards in place as well. Uh, the uh, kurin, as I said, is made of one piece of leather. It is uh, cut of this shape, which is very close to the size of the person's foot. It's then gathered up with stitches, and the laces are added to it as well. The kurin can be made from deer skin, as these are, or from bull, or greyhound, or even seal skin. And any of these types can be left with the hair on or with the hair off. Uh, in times of war, when men had to replace their shoes quickly, well, many times the animal is killed, the skin taken off, and put directly in the foot without any sort of tanning, since the, once it wore off, they could always get more uh, quickly and easily. In fact, Mark, the current has a shoe now that, that very much resembles it, and it's a forebearer of a shoe called the Gilly Brogue, very common today, worn by Highland men, men and women, especially men. And it's wrapped around the ankle up to the calf in a same, similar fashion to this particular shoe. And that brings us to the subject of bonnets. And uh, we have several different types here. Would you like to explain them? Sure. Gladly. All right. Where, where shall we start? Well, let's start with the oldest type. All right, the oldest type. The oldest type. This is a Tudor style bonnet. And tell us what it's called, William, or this style of bonnet. Uh, this is the uh, Renaissance style of brim bonnet. It's popular throughout most of uh, the British Isles. And uh, it's the ancestor of most of our berets and bonnets that are worn throughout Europe today. Uh, it's also the ancestor of the next hat we're going to show you, which is called a hummel, which is a specifically Scottish hat. Right. Here's a hummel. This one's cut from cloth. It was worn just so. 
18th century, they started wearing it with the cockade up. But before that, the Highland gentlemen wore it like so. Especially in battle when they charge, they pull that right over their eyes, grab their targe uh -huh. and a broadsword and scream bloody murder. And next we have another Hummel. This particular Hummel is knit, knit wool. And this is very curious. As a matter of fact, the lady that ma manufactured this is an anthropologist. And this particular one was found in a grave in Scotland, 1721, in, the, in mint condition. And she just copied it. So the style is accurate. The white cockade on it is a symbol of a Jacobite. The Jacobites were Highlanders in support of the Stuarts from 1689 through 1746. Two feathers in the bonnet meant you were a man of, of landed gentry, or one of the taxmen of the chief, or actually it's a chieftain. One feather, I'm sorry, is, is being a taxman. Two is a chieftain. And three eagle feathers would have been a chief of a clan. And it would be worn like so. Hmm. Well, this is a fine piece of head. Right. This particular bonnet, the kill monarch, was also worn in the 18th century, in the American Revolution, by a different regiment. The Gordons wore a yellow ostrich plume in theirs. And that was the mark of their regiment. And different regiments wore different color badges in their bonnets. Ron, I noticed this one's got leaves in it as well. Could you tell us about that? Aye. Every clan has its own plant badge. And there's a misnomer that clan tartans are for clans, per se. That's actually a falsehood. It, uh, the clan tartan didn't identify clans till later in history, Victorian times. King George IV, actually, period, 1822. Um, the plant badge identified clans. This would be Oakleaf. Oakleaf would be for clan Cameron. Clan MacDonald would wear a sprig of heather. And there are many other badges out there for the different clans. Now we go to the Glengarry, which was popular later in the Victorian period and worn to, through this day by Scottish regiments, pipers, and drummers. Uh, pipers generally wore, wear a Glengarry that is solid, and drummers wear the dice pattern here. The name Glengarry comes from the clan chief Glengarry, Gary Alistair MacDonald of Glengarry, who wore this flamboyant style of bonnet and caught on. And it's worn like so with the badge up. This particular badge is a modern badge. This is the Clan Cameron badge I'm illustrating here with the five arrows and the clan motto, Uno Ri Xie, each one together. Unite is what it means. And that is worn today. It's very prevalent, this versus the plant badges to identify the clan. Well, that's a junky piece of headgear as well. Oh, you look quite dapper, isn't it? Thank you. And I think we have one more type here to show off, don't we? Right. And that would be the Balmoros. Ah, the Balmoral. The Balmoral is another modern headgear, type of headgear, and its predecessor was the Hummel. You see the similar shape in the style of it. And these um, have, are worn with the same buckles or whatever you like. If you're a Jacobite, though, and still believe in the king over the water, and want to represent that, you'd wear a white cockade. But you won't have the white cockade in there if you're at some function with the queen present. Yeah, I'll just slip on my Balmoral here and put a nice little scrug in it. So, Bonnie. An alternate method for wearing the tartan is wearing the plate in this fashion. Today it's called a fly plate, but it's not as much material used. This is the same material I was wearing earlier in the program for my break and peel. It's held together with a brooch here and gathered, and also pleated. I am wearing that because under the waist I am wearing a pair of heel and trues. Heel and trues were prevalent in Scotland from the 17th through the 18th century. They are gartered, just as hose are at the side, and they were predominantly worn by Highland gentlemen and chiefs of the clan. There's a painting in Dunvegan Castle on the Isle of Skye of the MacLeod and MacLeod chief wearing this particular style of dress 
And this particular tartan, which was very prevalent in that period, is very close to what he's wearing in the portrait. And now, for the age-old question, what do these bonny lads wear underneath their kilts? For modern everyday wear, anything you'd like to wear underneath is actually proper. Uh, regular briefs or a boxer or whatever sort of uh, underwear you prefer. For period wear, you can uh, wear any type of drawers that were prevalent in those periods. Uh, they're usually just a very plain pair of white trunks which are held up at the waist by a drawstring. It can have an overlapped fly or a buttoned one as well. And as well, you can wear with the kilt a leather or a linen loincloth. Alternatively, you could wear the kilt by going regimental. Regimental meant wearing nothing at all under the kilt. I prefer it myself. Just knowing that is what makes a Scotsman so attractive. 